I'm really blessed in my life to uh, do work that I'm completely passionate about and also live in a country that is extremely dear to my heart. Um, about two years ago, I moved to Mumbai in India to, with my partner, set up uh, an incubator for social entrepreneurs in India. Um, and really what I want to do today is share a couple of stories of the social entrepreneurs that we support in India and share three insights or ideas that have come from our work um, that relate very much to the topic that uh, we're talking about today, which is the future of enterprise. But first, let me just tell you very briefly about my, my background. Why, why am I in India? Um, and uh, why am I working with social entrepreneurs? Um, until about 2007, I was, uh, had a pretty conventional career as a management and technology consultant. I was working with IBM, and I was traveling around the world um, advising companies on e-business strategy. Uh, what, I, what, what, I, what I came to uh, a realization um, was that if I continued doing this for the rest of my life, that by the time I was 60, I was going to be fundamentally unhappy with what I had achieved and what I contributed to the world and what I um, uh, um, left really as a legacy in the world. And I was particularly moved during my explorations as, uh, as to what else I could do in my life by uh, what I later discovered to be social entrepreneurs. And these people included people like um, Tim Smith, who set up the Eden Project in the UK, Michael Young, who um, was probably one of the most prolific, but um, relatively still unknown uh, social entrepreneurs in the UK who set up institutions such as the Open University, such as NHS Direct, um, such as the Consumers Association. And these were individuals who really had a vision for a society that uh, was better than the society that they were in right now. They, they envisioned institutions and change in that society that made society a better place to live in, and they left their legacy through doing that. Um, so I was really inspired by these individuals, and I shifted from my private sector consulting career into a career initially in the UK, uh, working as a consultant with social entrepreneurs in this country, helping them start up and then scale their ventures to, to a national level. And then um, the opportunity came up uh, to take the same model that I was working with here in, in the UK out to India. Um, and with my Indian partner, and backed by a real strong love of India, which I've been visiting since uh, 1998, uh, I moved to Mumbai. And I've been there since uh, for the last uh, two years, uh, running what is now Unlimited India. And uh, we now have a portfolio of startup social entrepreneurs that we're working with, uh, really helping to uh, incubate them, uh, providing them with the seed finance and the hands-on technical know-how to start up their successful, successful ventures, um, prepare them for further funding and investment, and um, set them up to create long-term social impact in India. Before I talk about two of the individuals that we're working with, I just want to set the context about India. And um, many of you might be aware of this, but many of you might not as well. Uh, as you might have seen in the program, India is one of the fastest developing economies in the world. It's also one of the countries that still has the most severe social problems in the world. And, and if there are 100 of you in this room, and all of you are adults, and if this was an Indian audience taken representatively from the Indian population, then um, 25, sorry, 30 of you uh, would be living on less than 70p a day. 70 of you would be living on less than £1.40 a day. 25% uh, 25 of you would be unable to read or write, uh, and the remaining, out of the remaining 75, uh, many of you would only be able to write your name, which counts as being literate um, in many of the studies that are carried out in India. Um, if all of you were children in India, uh, half of you would be malnourished. Um, the, the social problems in India are extremely, extremely widespread, and, and it really makes it an incredible place and an incredible opportunity to work in such an environment to help to drive social change. So let me share two stories with you about some of the individuals that we're working with, that we're incubating 
uh, through Unlimited India. This is Dhruv Lakra. Dhruv, I met Dhruv about three years ago uh, in one of my exploratory trips to India, and uh, he had just quit his job as, a, as an investment banker. Uh, and uh, he was fundamentally unhappy with the way his life was going, and he moved into the social sector. He didn't really know what he wanted to do, but he started to work in the social sector. Um, he then went to study um, overseas, and uh, during that time, his father had a, a really bad car accident and became a paraplegic. When he returned to India, he was looking for, for what to do with his life. And, uh, and his career, and he, two profound things happened. One, he was sitting on a bus in Mumbai, and he sat next to this individual, and he started to strike up a conversation, and the, the individual he was sitting next to could, couldn't reply, and, and he figured out that this, this person was deaf. And it made him realize that while blindness and other forms of disabilities are very visible disabilities, being deaf is an incredibly invisible disability. Um, at the same time, a few days later, he received a courier package at his home, and he realized that a courier person didn't have to say anything to do his service. And he put two and two together, and he said, well, here's an opportunity where I could help the deaf population in India. And by the way, India has the largest deaf population in the world. The opportunities for them uh, economically in terms of employment and education are uh, very, very poor. There's no single educational institution that's dedicated to deaf people. Um, and so he's made it his mission to serve uh, deaf people in India and really improve their employment and their educational uh, prospects as well as spreading the word about what deafness means to the general population. And he's done that by creating this courier company called Miracle Couriers. And um, these are some of his courier boys. He employs he employs at the moment, he's, he's literally been running this uh, uh, eight months. He employs 35 boys and girls uh, that are delivering courier packages uh, and, and letters uh, in Mumbai. And uh, he has a vision to uh, take his model uh, right across India. Um, the second person I want to talk about is a lady called Puja Taparia. Puja Taparia uh, was extremely moved uh, a couple of years ago by a play that she saw on incest in India. And when she did some research about uh, child sexual abuse in India, she discovered some absolutely remarkable statistics. In a government survey conducted in 2007 with 20,000 young individuals in, across India, she found that she found that um, 53, the, the government survey showed that 53% of children in India have experienced some form of sexual abuse. 78% of those individuals are boys. And for the victims, 50% of the perpetrators were known to those victims. It is an incredible uh, problem in India. I won't go into the details of why it's a problem. Uh, but it is an incredible problem. And there's only, in a country of 1.1 billion people, three organizations across the country that are solely dedicated to tackling child sexual abuse. And so she was so profoundly moved that she set up an organization called ARPAN that is, uh, has a vision to fundamentally change the perception and the treatment uh, and the uh, tackling of child sexual abuse across, across India. And this is uh, one of the shots from one of the videos that she's made about uh, the, the classroom training that, that her team does, working with kids, working with teachers, and working with adults. And she's working now on a small scale still, because she's still early stage, but with about 250 uh, children and parents and teachers in Mumbai. But she has a very big vision across the country. So. What Dhruv and Puja have it had in common is, is an incredible desire within them to create positive change in India, and on a huge scale. Uh, what they lacked as uh, startup entrepreneurs was uh, a support environment in which they can successfully start up. So they lacked a seed funding, um, hands-on support, technical know-how to how to start up a new uh, social based 
business or enterprise. Um, they lack access to networks. Uh, they lack recognition. Um, and what Unlimited India provides is that ecosystem in which um, individuals like these can successfully start up new ventures. We work in a space that no one else is, is working in really in India, which is that early stage uh, concept through to um, initial uh, proof of concept pilot and through to a stage where the organization, their social venture is ready for further funders and investors. And uh, we, uh, through, a, through a team of people on the ground, through a team of experts, provide all of that support. So we provide small amounts of funding, large amounts of technical know-how to help individuals like these develop as leaders and develop their organizations so that they're ready to really scale and, and implement large-scale change. Um, we ourselves are funded through institutional donors at the moment, um, but we increasingly we're developing our own income streams and a lot of our financing is provided in the form of repayable loans and increasingly zero interest loans that uh, are going to be coming back to us as an organization um, in a number of years' time. So um, we are growing in our own model as well. We've been thinking about it quite hard and we're still evolving, but it's really, we've been asking ourselves the question, what is the DNA of a successful social entrepreneur? What's the DNA of their approach? What makes them successful? And many people have often said, well, it's actually the, mel the melding of, of a social approach with an economic approach. And in the middle, you get something which is social entrepreneurship. Uh, and this, to some extent, is true, but it, we think it's only really part of the picture. And people have given examples, for example, of putting Mother Teresa together with Richard Branson, and that's social entrepreneurship. Well, it's not quite that simple, we think. We think there's, an, uh, there's other elements that come into play that are equally important. And one is um, a political element. And, and we use the word political in the broadest possible sense. It's really about systems. What we've studied about social entrepreneurs who've really achieved huge success in the world is that they have not only mastered solving the social problem that they're, that they're that they're looking to solve, they're not only mastering the economic model for making that happen, but they've also mastered understanding the system within which this economic, or oh sorry, this social problem is occurring. Because ultimately, social entrepreneurship is tackling systemic problems. And social entrepreneurs need to therefore understand why the system is, is creating that problem and also therefore tackle at a systemic level that problem so it simply doesn't occur again. Otherwise, you're simply just treating the symptom rather than the cause. So it could be that there's three elements involved, but we feel there's also one extremely fundamental fourth element involved, and that's really something that ties all of these things together and that we've noticed in every single successful high-impact social entrepreneur, and that's really a spiritual core. And the spiritual core takes uh, or has manifests in two ways. It manifests in a fundamental understanding of who they are as individuals and, and their place in the world. And it also manifests in a fundamental understanding of the issue that they're sol solving. So ultimately, it's about a connection. It's about a connection with themselves and a connection with the world. And I once heard a, a venture capitalist talk about why um, startups fail. And he said, it's nothing, all, it's nothing about all the, the conventional reasons um, about a bad idea or, or um, lack of cash flow or whatever. It's actually fundamentally about a lack of authenticity. Because um, ultimately, entrepreneurs are there responding to the world. And the more that they can be in tune with themselves and the world, the more likely they're going to be uh, creating a long-term success. So um, that, in brief, is, is the model that we're developing to understand why social entrepreneurs can be successful. And we're applying this model to the social entrepreneurs that come through our incubator to really help them develop. And I would suggest that this could also be a model that we could think about in terms of the future of enterprise, both for the people within the enterprises, but also for the enterprises themselves. So at the core, we hope, of a, of a, a future ideal enterprise would be a very strong spiritual core. It would be a, 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 a mixed uh, economic and social model so that there's responsibility about the social impact that the enterprise is making in the world. And also a strong awareness and, and a um, guardianship or custodianship of the political or the systemic environment within which the enterprise operates. The third and final 
the thing I really wanted, or the idea I wanted to share with you is that enterprise is not just about entrepreneurs. Many of you I know in this room are entrepreneurs and, and will identify with this. Um, we, if the purpose of our work at Unlimited India was simply to support the approximately 50 social entrepreneurs we're incubating right now, or the 100 we want to achieve by the end of next year, or the 1,000 we want to achieve uh, within three to five years, then we would achieve a fraction of the impact that we want to achieve. Our, our work is really about sharing the stories of people like Dhruv and Pooja so to inspire not thousands, but hundreds of thousands and millions of other people in the world, and in India particularly, that they can access the same skills, the same tools, the same resources that, that Dhruv and Pooja are accessing within them that can enable them to make a positive change in the world. We all have these within us. We're not all entrepreneurs. We're not all going to lead organizations, but we can all be enterprising. And that is the message that we want to share. And I hope that the message that I would love to leave with you. Thank you very much.